Okay, I think it's about time to get started. Um, I'm Cliff Lynch, the director of the Coalition for Networked Information, and uh, you've joined us for one of the um, project briefing sessions for our spring 2020 virtual meeting, which is now roughly at midpoint. It will run through the end of May. Our presentation today addresses um, engagement through um, supporting research and student success through statistical consulting. And I think that this gets at several things that are really important um, as we look at um, how we support our teaching and learning and our research enterprise. Uh, one piece of this is about data science and statistics is broader than data science, but certainly is intimately related to it. And the growth and interest of da around data science has certainly placed much more emphasis on statistics broadly. The other side is how we engage with the support of the research effort, including student research, which is an important part of student success, I think, and of having a, um, having a um, successful student experience at our institutions. And uh, so I'm very eager to hear this talk. Uh, Jonathan Cain will be presenting and uh, he, he'll, he'll talk you through this. And at the end, we'll uh, take questions and, an and uh, try and answer them. Diane Goldenberg Hart from CNI will moderate the Q&A. Um, I note we have a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Please feel free to use that at any point during the presentation. Ask questions as they occur to you and um, we, will, we will come back to all of those at the end and uh, try and address them. And with that, it just remains for me to thank Jonathan uh, so much for doing this and to thank you all for joining us. And with that, over to you, Jonathan. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate um, you inviting me here today to give this project up, um, uh, update. And I also want to take a moment and thank everyone who's taking from their day to come and um, learn a little bit about what we're doing in supporting um, research and student success through um, statistical consulting, especially considering the really um, unprecedented um, events that we've all been experiencing re uh, recently. So with that spirit in mind, um, I'd like to keep it a, a little informal and walk you through uh, what we've been doing um, in a little bit um, in a bit of a, an experimental mode um, and really responding to um, the change um, in service delivery as well. So here's a really rough agenda for us today. Um, uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about me, not because I am also important, um, but rather it, it gives a little bit of information about um, how the, the service was designed and some of the factors that went into it. We'll talk about the history of data services at the University of Oregon. We'll talk about partnership formation and the founding of our statistical service. Um, look at some of the guiding principles of the service, um, which ties back into the About Me portion. And then um, some of the emerging challenges that we uh, uh, have faced along the way and are probably going to face moving forward. And then uh, think about how we've uh, been gauging the impact of our services because so much of what we do is about figuring out impact. And then uh, ultimately we're going to talk about the future of the service, um, what it looks like now um, and moving forward in our really changed environment of higher education. So a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Jonathan Kane. I currently have the pleasure of serving as the head of data services and interim director of digital strategies at, in the libraries. Uh, my academic background is in anthropology, uh, Africana studies, and then of course, library and information uh, studies. Um, I have a certification, uh, I'm a certified data carpentry instructor or trainer, 
and I've been certified teaching the Taiyiverse. The reason that I, I, I uh, bring all this to the forefront is because it's not a traditional, at least a lot of the resumes I've seen, it's not a traditional uh, data science focused uh, background. Um, it's heavy, it, yes, with um, biology and anthropology, but very heavy in the humanities and, and cultural studies. And I think this background um, with working in science libraries for, uh, for some time has really um, influenced how I thought about developing service um, around statistical support and thinking about the communities that um, would need that sort of support from a space like the library. So a little bit about the history of um, and data services uh, at the University of Oregon. Um, so data services is the founding, is the, the, the holding department for the statistical consulting service. And it is a relatively new service, it's less than three years old, and I have the privilege of being the first head of that department. And on some levels, it was a response um, to definite emergent uh, needs on campus. Um, the idea of um, how do we support researchers who are creating data? How do we, in a, in, in a really effective way, um, make our researchers more, com um, help our researchers be as competitive as possible by giving them the tools um, when seeking grants and other um, funding opportunities? And how do we also um, put our efforts into um, being a part of that research life cycle and educating our students around the research process. Uh, and so we started the department that really focused on uh, research data management um, and, and pulling on my background with um, data sourcing and then working with um, R uh, in particular for data cleanup and um, processing in, pr in preparation for analysis. Um, and then there we launched the Oregon um, data, University of Oregon Data Science Initiative, which was a very multidisciplinary approach um, to data science on, on our campus, on a very distributed campus. And so there's a lot of, there were a lot of strengths in doing this. I think it opened up the idea of data science to disciplines that people don't historically think of as part of data science. Um, but it also pr produced a lot of a number of challenges in, um, I would think, in getting um, all the requisite um, um, backgrounds to, to speak the, the same sort of language. And I thought there was an opportunity here um, for, the, for the libraries to be a partner in some way. And so um, put forward data services as a, a, a part um, of supporting that data, the data science initiative. So working on the idea of providing foundational workshops on research data management, working with data management plans, um, uh, teaching the introduction to R and Python uh, to support those efforts. Um, as the data science initiative really matured on campus, one of the areas that was identified as needing um, more support is the idea of statistical uh, learning. Um, and historically, there's not been a centralized service for statistics at the University of Oregon. And so there, there have been other units that may have done it on and off, but I thought there was a, a great opportunity for the libraries to actually be a central place in a really distributed system to provide that sort of support. Um, so to get started, I really wanted to understand what the campus research environment, the research and teaching environment looked like. So working with one of my graduate assistants, uh, Avalon Mason, we did a, a scraping of the catalog of courses at the campus for 2017-2018. And we noted every class that had um, something to do with research. Um, or something to do with data. And as this visualization shows, um, research design, research methods, data analysis show up a, a lot of different places. Mixed methods, data management, they all show up across disciplines. 
And so with that, I felt really confident that there's something unique that we can offer as one of the centralized services where everyone on campus can come and um, learn and use our resources to play a role in supporting um, data literacy and statistical literacy. But when thinking the program through, um, there, had, there were a couple of things that we were concerned about uh, when I went to my supervisor, um, Mark Watson, and uh, then uh, Dean, Adrian Lim, about starting this, this service. And there are two big things. One, it's a, a pretty large um, expense. And then two, it is a, uh, how do we get partners to actually in, invest with uh, their time in the process? And so I did a, a, a proposal um, to the graduate school, um, which Dean Lim was fantastic and, and, and bringing uh, the library and the graduate school together. Um, to try to get uh, to, to fund this service. And so we, we started off as a one-year pilot on statistical um, consulting uh, support service for UO students, which um, would be housed in the data services department uh, and then um, working with the graduate school to hire GEs um, to provide the consultation. So the consultations, um, uh, the libraries would host, manage, and provide space for uh, the pilot program through the data services department. Um, they would partially fund it through the form of uh, waivers uh, for those two GEs. Um, the libraries would hire a statistical uh, specialist, a research analyst specialist, um, uh, to serve as a staff member and that, that would be the core of the team that would serve our, our campus of 20 some uh, uh, thousand people. Um, and I think it, we, we came up with a pretty good model to support that, that active learning and research community. Um, overall, when we did our, our catalog scrape, we identified 141 uh, classes pertaining to statistics, data analysis, or research methods um, at EO. And as you saw in that visualization, they, they ran the gamut um, from college, across colleges, schools, and departments. Uh, another thing that I was really thinking about is how absolutely essential it is to have statistical um, knowledge or ability to analyze statistics and data in, in the modern world. And I just uh, saw someone sent me this tweet about data literacy being a social justice issue. And I wholeheartedly agree, I think, uh, information literacy is an extremely important uh, issue along those lines and um, it becomes doubly so when we start to think about uh, how much uh, data science has uh, some issues with representation. And so in designing the, the service and sort of the outcomes for me, one of the things that I really wanted to do was embrace the, the university and I think um, now um, to a lesser extent higher ed intent to um, really address issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion um, in their, in their, their, on their campuses in terms of curriculum, in terms of employment, in terms of community building. And so these were three big considerations that I wanted um, to really engage with as the libraries decided to in invest in not only in uh, data services, but in statistical consulting. So for the, the wider data science representation issue, um, how could we play a role in increasing data diversity, equity, and inclusion? And then more importantly, uh, for uh, well, more immediately for us, how can we ensure that diversity, equity, and inclusion was uh, a guiding principle that was present in the makeup of our program? Um, so we wanted to think about who's going to be in the room, how do we help uh, um, provide people a space to be in the room, and then provide them the skills to be in the room once they leave our institution, um, and how um, do we ensure that everyone has the same opportunity to, to achieve at the same level, no matter where they started. Um, <clears throat> when we think about underrepresentation of Black and Latinx students, and um, 
and women in STEM careers, a lot of times they talk about not having the foundational um, courses from high school. And we wanted to make sure that if just because your high school didn't um, provide you that opportunity or your, your um, undergraduate experience didn't provide you that opportunity uh, to learn these skills, that um, you wouldn't be completely shut out of these opportunities. And so we designed for that work as well. So in order to do that, I really wanted us to include diverse experts. We, I wanted us to have an inviting and culturally competent curriculum. I wanted us to think about the whole learner because everyone's learning experience is not the same. Everyone's life experience is not the same. Our, our learners come to us from completely different backgrounds and um, we have to acknowledge that and we want to account for that because we want them to be successful. We wanted to make it, uh, make sure that we kept it low cost. Right now, all of our offerings are free and I hope that we're able to, to maintain that um, in terms of supporting our students. We wanted to make it available, understanding that um, so many of our students or our learners are, are working um, either in the day or in the evening. And so having the widest variety of um, times available to take courses is important and make sure that we're able to provide accurate expectations of what one should know coming in um, or what we can provide in terms of support and knowledge coming out. And then we wanted to be able to demonstrate a value um, not only for ourselves, um, to our, our funders and supporters, but also demonstrate an actual value to the learners because we're asking them to give up their time uh, that they could be doing something else to learn these skills and we're saying that it's totally worth it for them to do so. So how do we demonstrate that value? Um, our GEs came from a variety of, uh, of backgrounds, anthropology, coming from public planning and management, PhD, PhD students, um, master students, backgrounds in statistics, backgrounds in GIS, um, econometrics, um, so trained uh, um, um, different ethnic and gender backgrounds or, or um, representation, trying to make sure that we had as wide a, a, a tent as possible um, of our actual knowledge experts. And so this is the service that came out of that process. Data services um, with consultations that were free to statistical, uh, excuse me, free statistical consultations for graduate and undergraduate students. And it's important to stress that because as a part of our, our programming, um, we were not designed to give that consultative support to faculty members. Um, so uh, the pilot program um, staffed by one half-time classified position, that's our statistical consultant, uh, two part-time graduate uh, student statistical consultants, one uh, data services GE um, that is not a statistical consultant, but is the data services GE that is closely aligned with that program, focusing on data science, GIS, and uh, programming. And then uh, two non-tenure track faculty librarians who, who are providing, um, uh, providing Okay, um, logistical and instructional support. So some really quick numbers. Um, uh, when we launched basically in early October, up until the end of November, these are what our initial numbers look like. And we were really excited about that. So 164 uh, student consultations, 39 of those consultations were unique visits from graduate students. 60% um, of our users came back more than once. And our disciplines came, our, our students came from across disciplines. You can see the wide variety of um, programs that are represented in this less than stellar graphic, but uh, I wanted to give you a, a, an idea that they're coming from all over uh, campus. One of the things that I spoke about. Uh, briefly was making sure um, that we had a curriculum that was um, really reflective of people who are coming in and working to make people feel uh, welcome. So you can see a wide variety of the workshops. 
um, that we offer in addition to our uh, consultation service uh, that teach basic skills, GIS, Python, R, statistics. Um, but I also want to highlight that one of our GEs really um, found a, a, a niche, excuse me, a market um, teaching R in Chinese, an introduction to R in Chinese, um, which was a really um, uh, unique opportunity for us, um, which shows um, hiring for really uh, for a diversity of experience is really important. Um, this has been a really popular um, uh, workshop series. We've run it every term. And um, it was the first workshop series that we had that had 0% doubt, meaning that everyone who signed up um, actually attended uh, the, the, the session. And moving into this term, as we've uh, made our transitions, um, in its final term, I think we had 35 initial signups and 35 attendants, I believe. Um, so we, um, I think this is, uh, illustrates the importance of um, hiring, to, uh, hiring really a wide spectrum of folks to do the work. Um, I think we are able to reach um, a, a far wider audience than we would if we hadn't done that planning in the beginning. So of course, um, in, in the beginning of this term, uh, Corona um, uh, it caused some real um, uh, changes in, in the way we operate. And so I wanted to address that. Um, we've moved from in-person to online, um, like most uh, institutions of higher learning. And I think that our, our transition was made far easier by the fact that we were designing for an online presence already. Uh, you saw the size of the, the department staff um, and the university actually has more than one campus. So uh, we were trying to figure out how do we reach our, our Portland campus, for example, or our Charleston uh, campus, for example. And we we're thinking about moving online and we had begun to build scaffolding for that. And so when the directive came that we were moving to a remote environment, we were able to swing uh, that way pretty easily. Um, so uh, we set up a, vir uh, uh, a virtual service for making a request for appointments or just actually stop by a, a virtual help desk. And uh, we can see um, some of the out, uh, we've started to get some data back about that. Um, We've seen, a sm uh, I've been informed, we've seen a small uh, drop off in undergraduate students uh, coming, but that's been an uptick in graduate students with um, far more, uh, more dissertating and master uh, thesis writing um, students um, taking advantage of our consultation services, or actually, sorry, utilizing our services. And I think uh, we've seen an increase in time moving up to uh, an hour for most consultations at this point. So um, while the overall numbers have not changed, the way those numbers are represented has changed. The, the way people have responded to using the service has changed. Um, uh, as I was saying, our drop-in service has dropped, uh, has become a smaller portion. So 80, almost 88% of our um, interactions are um, based on scheduled appointments rather than drop-in service now. Um, and I think that also speaks to our, our, um, our users in terms of what part of the research process they're in. And it is uh, later in the academic year, so people will probably have established relationships um, with con consultants rather than finding them for the first time at this point. Um, but there are some, some questions about uh, the future of the service. So we were initially um, we were initially renewed for a second year of the pilot program, um, but there's been a general hiring freeze. So we are now facing a, re a reduced staffing. Um, so we're thinking that this is going to lead to a reduction in live and new workshop content, um, and really switching to a self-directed le a lesson uh, based um, um, methodology that we're hosting on our learning campus learning management system. And we're currently recording the, those sessions now and editing them and adding exercises to try to uh, replicate something of that, that experience. 
We're also thinking of um, eliminating the drop-in service, at least initially, um, because we're not going to have uh, three of the, uh, the positions that were initially uh, staffing that service. And then we are hoping to make up for that by expanding our connections to curriculum. So um, there's a, a, a greater um, emphasis on providing the service that's immediately needed right then and um, thinking about beginning a fee for service um, uh, system for folks that are pursuing grants so that we can support our, our faculty members as well. Um, but I think this is me approaching time and I wanted to leave room for questions, but I wanted to give you a really um, brief but high level overview of what we're doing why we designed it the way we have and our um, the way that we've responded to the challenges of the COVID uh, uh, epidemic and its effect on our um, institutions moving from in-person experiences to remote experiences. So with that, I'm going to say thank you and look forward to answering any questions that you may have. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, thanks for that overview um, and for the description of what a really interesting project um, and congratulations. Uh, sounds really successful and I'm very sorry to hear that um, it's undergoing some strains now given the current circumstances. So hope that uh, all will be well there. I really also appreciate the background, uh, your own personal background that you shared with us to help us think about how um, people from a variety of backgrounds can come into this kind of work and help others uh, grapple with the, the technologies and these strategies. So thank you for that context. I want to go ahead and invite our um, attendees, uh, whom I also welcome. Thank you so much for um, carving out part of your day to spend at CNI's 2020 virtual meeting. And please, with that, uh, share with us your questions, comments. There's a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. If you want to go ahead and type your question or your comment in there, I'll be happy to read it aloud. And Jonathan will um, address your questions live. You can also type them into the chat box. Um, while we're waiting, for folks to type their questions in, I just want to remind everyone that this is part of CNI's Spring 2020 virtual meeting, and I've just uh, chatted out there to you a direct link to the schedule. Uh, the meeting will continue through the end of May, so please take a look for plenty more offerings. And with that, I will read now our first question, which comes from Marcel Fortin. Um, Marcel writes, thank you, Jonathan. Are you following the Carpentries curriculum or have you developed your own? Oh. Uh, thank you, uh, Marcel. I think um, that's a really good question. And I, the answer is it's a blend of, of the two. Um, so um, we've started with a, the, the Carpentries um, curriculum and uh, for some things, for example, like S SQL and, and Git. Um, but we've also tailored it based on some of our experiences with our particular learner com communities. Um, and we've also uh, been using the Tidyverse curriculum in uh, to teach uh, the Tidyverse R. Um, uh, so I think we are working at um, expanding um, the number of folks that are, are uh, Carpentries uh, certified. And I think we will rely more heavily on the curriculum as we expand um, the number of people who are participating as trainers and helpers on our campus. So a bit yes, but we've also developed our own. Thank you for that question, um, Marcel. And, and thank you, Jonathan. And I, I was just curious to know who is uh, who's working on that curriculum? Who who has designed designed that? Is that something by committee or, yeah, who's working on that? So um, a number of people. Um, I want to say uh, 
uh, our GEs have been fantastic. So Yuan Fang, who developed their curriculum uh, for RN Chinese, Jay Matante, who's been working heavily on our Python and introduction to ArcGIS um, work, and um, uh, Alicia De Louise, who's been doing a lot of work around uh, introduction to statistics with R, um, Cameron Mulder, who has been doing um, a heavy lift with consultations and um, doing work on surveys, and of course, Gabrielle Hayden, our, re our reproducibility librarian, working with Git and SQL. Um, myself, a bit around R and, and Tidyverse and working with Tidy Data, more of the data munging stuff, how librarian-y can I be? Um, <laughs> and, but it's been very much a team effort um, in going out. But by and large, it's those people that I mentioned, excluding myself, that have been doing such a tremendous lift to get us to be in a position of offering around 26 individual um, um, workshops per term. Oh, that's um, tremendous. Which is uh, really impressive. Um, yeah. I really appreciate their work. That's great. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. We have another question now from uh, Kiri Carini, who asks, what was your experience in getting the word out across campus about your services? And do you feel like you reached the students that you were hoping to get? Oh, uh, thank you, Carrie. That's a great question. Um, I've, our experiences have been fairly, um, fairly mixed. They've been really high touch, right? This is our first year. And so we, we relied a lot on uh, personal relationships to get the word out. Um, so writing individual faculty and in, uh, for example, like psychology and computer science and sociology, reaching out to the subject specialist and asking them to spread the message on their behalf. Um, it was really uh, fortunate to work with the folks over at the McNair Scholars Program um, and sort of getting our services in front of them early on, um, which was really great and it um, helped us reach part of those communities that I was really interested in. Uh, um, and, and bringing in because um, a lot of times I don't think we all know what's available to us on campus. I, I certainly didn't know um, when I started. Um, also, I've, we were able to really uh, reach out to uh, existing tutoring uh, services on campus. Mm -hmm. And while we don't do tutoring, um, uh, we found a really nice relationship with tutoring services where the high level, level questions that were beyond their scope, they would start to send to us. And we would send like a lot of the first year experience questions around intro to stats to them. Mm -hmm. um, and that worked out really well. Um, but we, we are hoping to have a far wider um, outreach moving forward. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's, a it's definitely a learning experience. Um, yeah. Hopefully year two, we will get greater um, uh, greater acknowledgement and other and other communities that we just haven't gotten yet. Great. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Kiri, and thanks for that answer, Jonathan. And we have another question from Jane Scott now, who asks, "Do you have any policies around author contributor attribution with these consults? Does your staff get author attribution for their assistance?" It's a great question, and we've. <sighs> not tackle that they're not doing ideally they are not doing work at that level um we are, we're hopeful that people are, are saying um they came in and got help with analysis but not, let me let me pause we're not doing the analysis for them mm -hmm. we're helping them determine whether this is the proper way to go and um, hopefully um, those, that is being acknowledged. But we haven't actually tackled that question about author attribution. I don't, I don't think that was a pressing thought when we were developing the service. But I think as this term, now that you bring it to the front of my mind, as this term is developed and we're starting to see an increase in our, our dissertating um, students, and maybe something that I we should talk about inside our our, our team. Mm -hmm. 
That was a great question, Jane. <laughs> yeah. Yes, it, yes, it was. Oh, my. Thank you. All right. Well, great questions. Uh, thanks to our attendees. If you have any other questions, please feel free to type them in. Um, and I also just want to invite anyone who would like to speak directly with Jonathan or make a comment live. Um, you can raise your hand, your virtual hand in this environment, and I can unmute you and uh, you can share your thoughts, chat with Jonathan about what it takes to um, get some kind of cons consultative uh, program like this off the ground if you're interested in exploring something like that for your institution, um, I'm sure he would be happy to, to chat with you about that. And I'm not seeing any more questions or any more hands. So, and that given that we're a little bit past the end time for this webinar, I'm going to uh, thank Jonathan once again, thank our attendees for coming.